Yeah, you're kidding. I wanted a pie shirt, but I said I have a pie tattoo. Does that count? I never heard of pie day before. I think it's a new thing. My daughter, um, they had this big thing like yesterday. They celebrated it because they have C-Saps today. But oh, okay. They brought in a lot of pie, and they, and they spent the whole class time making some kind of chain with all the digits of pie to see how far they could get in the hour that they had in class. Cool. So it's, I guess it's a big deal now. I wonder if we should have an E-Day, too, because there's no food for that. But. <laughs> you can invent one. Yeah. E-food. E-food. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like everything is E-something anyway. Yeah, that's true. So E-Day, I think it might get a little confusing is all. What other cool movies? Isn't there a gamma number or something? Gamma, Oilers, Gamma, Gamma. Yeah. Oilers, yeah. That one's probably less known to people. My poor book is completely. These books, I getting destroyed with the binding because it doesn't stay open. Well, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's really hard to keep this book open, yeah. Oh, well, you know it will be well used by the time you're done with it. It must be yeah. one, one open <laughs> thing. At least it doesn't bust. Right, yeah, that's yeah. a good thing. That's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's the next assignment. This isn't due until After spring April 4th. Boy, you ever lucky, huh? So you're you're in April's April luck right now. Cause that's three weeks away. <laughs> um, so let's see. You have an exam due next week. Yeah. Uh, that's what's due. So um, <clears throat> I did have one comment about the exam, and that is that the word bounded is left off of Part 4B. So prob exam typo. An exam. One. Uh, problem 4B, let H be a bounded sesquilinear form. Um, I, I think I just left off the word bounded because everything is bounded in my mind. <laughs> okay. But it's interesting, but anyway. So I had to add that word. So it was actually corrected on the website as well. So you need to, if you're copying the exam, you could just put the word bounded in. Or just for part B. Just for, part, for part B. Part A. part A was already, you will show that it's bounded. I think for part A, let's see, do I ask you to show that it's bounded? It asks what is the norm. What is the norm? So that automatically implies that it's bounded or unless the norm is infinite. Okay. Okay. So in part B, I'm assuming it is bounded. Um, somebody found that typo. Somebody who was really getting into it. Eric, <laughs> I talked to him yesterday. He said you sent him some hints. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, see, that was the one of the things. The other thing, okay, the other things that I mentioned was uh, he asked for a problem one. Any comments about the density? I said, uh, on problem one, I said, show that x infinity has a shouter basis. That was a hint for uh, showing density. I wasn't going to give a whole lot of hints, so I just said that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then in problem three, the comments were about problems three and f parts three and four. Uh, and then on that one, uh, to show, so the comment was this, what, what, what is the context of this problem? The context of this problem is um, is that um, is that 
capital Y is a plane. If I think about, if I think of the Hilbert spaces as being R3, and I take capital Y as a plane through the origin, and I take capital Y1 to be a line through the origin that lies in that plane, so this capital Y1 is a line through the origin. Capital Y equals plane through origin. This is on test. Typo in exam one. This is a typo. This is uh, hints on exam one. Problem number three. Y plane to the origin. Uh, y one equals a line through origin that lies in Y. Okay. Then. Uh, if I take and my point X was something in R3, the point of this problem is to sh is what you expect is that if I project first onto the plane Y, orthogonal projection onto the plane, and then I project from there onto the orthogonally onto the line. Okay. All right. That's the same as projecting originally directly onto the line. Okay? So here's X. This is Y. And this is Y1. Okay? Here's Y, which is this point. And here's Y1, which is this point. X, Y, and Y1. Those are the three things. And Z was, there is no Z in here. X, Y, Z. <laughs> okay. There's no Z in the discussion of this problem, but I'm sure you'll bring plenty of Z's into your own discussion, okay, <laughs> of this problem. So parts three and four just followed the expected result that if I, this is called the, sometimes called the double projection, uh, result or something that if I first project onto Y and then go from there onto Y1, that's the same as projecting directly onto Y1. That's all that I'm discussing here. I just want you to fill in kind of the blanks and show that it really is true. I could have discussed it that way, but instead I decided to write it out in terms of these properties. So let's establish those properties. Okay? in the context of the Hilbert space. All right, and I think that was about it. Those are the only questions I responded to. Any other questions? Then you can send Eric back a couple more hints. <laughs> Eric said he should be, might be here on Thursday, by the he way. He said he was going to come, yeah. Okay, because they're doing CSAPs. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I haven't really done it yet. I just glanced at the first one. and. Do you want to use the hint, or because it looks like it would have been easier just to show that as a norm, but do you need to show that it's... Um, okay, show that it is a norm. I think it's space. easier to show that it's in a product space. Just, I just just take the... You, you can look in Chapter 1 for the Euclidean norm. Sure. Okay. If you think that's easier, fine, but I find it easier to do it. Sure. If I needed to do it from scratch and I didn't want to look in a book, I would do it using the inner product. It's up to you. <coughs> Um, just to make sure for number five, the last problem, um, we have a linear bounded operator T, and we use that to define an operator S, mm -hmm. and S goes from H to H, mm -hmm. and S is defined as the identity operator plus... The composition of the adjoint with the original. T, right. T star T. Okay. Yeah, so it's just that business. So you get the T star T coming in there. I think this is a... Uh, this is actually a problem right out of the book. Yeah. 3.10, number 10, or something like that. Okay, so it's right out of the book. It's just an even number problem out of the book. Um, how do you show, just use the definition of what a one-to-one -one operator is. I think in the book he says it's invertible uh, on, from, its, from its range. The null space is zero. Okay. Yeah. If, if one thing equals if if uh, 
if SX1 equals SX2, then X1 equals X2. Okay? That's what you need to show. In other words, if, if, you, if SX is equal to 0, then X is equal to 0. So <coughs> that's um, the check that you need to make. And just write, start writing that down in terms of this operator. <coughs> and where you know, since you do have the inner product space in this case, so that's my only hint. <laughs> H is an inner product space. Okay. <laughs> You always use the inner product anyway whenever you start working with this adjoint. So it should be obvious, okay? <laughs> what, you, what you're supposed to do. So you just kind of follow your nose on that one. It just sort of starts falling out. It's not, there's no intuition at this point, unfortunately. So that's computational. Other comments? Okay, well maybe there'll be more questions later. So one more day. Uh, yes, I do have those solutions and uh, everything, and uh, notes as well that I'm going to do. Homework 7. Might just, I don't know, might be helpful for this. Yeah, absolutely. Homework 7 was part of the uh, things. And there was one um, problem 8, 3.6 number. Is that one of this is your homework, your current solutions, right? Okay, yeah. This, this is a different business, I guess. From the old homework, I still have some old homework problems. Um, here we go. Okay, and those are wrong, please. Um, the homework that I turned back, some of the people just got turned back today. Um, I noticed there was still some, tr my solutions on 3.6 number 8 was a little bit in error as well. So that was the one showing that, uh, that, if, that if you had, um, it was an if and only if problem that gave people a lot of difficulty in general. Um, but H, problem 3.6. Now it wasn't 3.6, 3.5 numbers, 8. 3.5 number 8, there are some, there's some, um, my solutions have some typo in it. Not typo, but it's uh, some missing stuff. Okay, so I just make a point so that to co correct the error. Um, oops, 3.5 number 8 was the hard problem that we had in this chapter, <laughs> okay. Um, if, you have ortho, if you have an orthonormal sequence, is that it? An orthonormal sequence, EK orthonormal sequence. But it wasn't assumed to be total in a Hilbert space H, okay. And I put M equals the span of the EK. And then the theorem was for every X and H we have X belongs to the closure of the span if and only if um, X can be written as summation X EK EK. So basically, the closure um, was itself total. The closure of the span. Basically, what this is saying in terms of the totality, that if you've got an orthonormal sequence in H, then um, it's total in the closure of its span. Okay. So the hard part was um, was not with the forward implication here. X in M bar implies this. 
Okay, this reverse implication was immediate because if x is written out as an infinite sum, then in particular as the limit of the finite sums in norm. Okay, so that immediately implies that you have a sequence of elements of m that converges to something, and therefore that something is an m bar. Okay, so this was trivial basically. Well, not trivial, but close to trivial. All right. <laughs> Calls too trivial. Okay. <laughs> and the other part was hard. And basically, and this one was harder, okay? Fairly hard. And what you had to show, basically you had to represent, well, you know that um, that X can be written that way. Let's see, is that what it is? No, it was the other way, yeah. So I assume that X is in M bar, okay? So X equals the limit of xn, some xn, which I could represent as something alpha sub k super n, ek, k goes from 1 to k sub n. You had to couple, you had to add a couple parameters. Some people write it k equals 1 to infinity, but you can only have finally many alpha k's not zero because we're only in the span of m, all right, which is finite linear combinations. So you have to write it this way, and then from there you have to basically show that um, eventually X can be written this way. So, so you, you use the fact that X was the limit of XN to get some information together with Bessel's inequality. And I hope that I can still, I hope I can prove it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's not that easy. So then where do you go from there? You know that that x you know that x squared is greater than or equal to the summation of the uh, absolute value of the Fourier coefficients. That's Bessel's inequality. Okay? So this is a finite sum. K goes from one to infinity. You also know that x minus xn squared, okay, is basically an epsilon. It's going to zero. It goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, but on the other hand, x minus xn squared can be written out in terms of this representation for xn. It comes out to be summation um, x ek minus alpha kn squared k goes from 1 to kn plus summation kn plus 1 to infinity. K equals K. Oh, uh, yeah, this is just a computation which everybody made. Uh, like that. Uh, I think that's how it went. Wait a second. Uh, wait a second. Uh, I'm sorry. That's not quite right. Well, it is a computation. Let's go ahead and make the computation. Maybe I made the computation wrong, too. Let's just double check it. It's. Uh, x minus summation k goes from 1 to k sub n alpha k n e k uh, in a product of itself I don't know what the heck I did make sure I still got this problem right I just gave well I gave homework solutions to this before uh, so here it is okay Either that or maybe I got it wrong and nobody's gotten it right yet. Okay? <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Oh, I see. This is greater than or equal to. That's what I did. Yes. Oh, I see what I did. I see what I did. I'm going to do it this way. Instead of equal, I'm going to do greater than or equal to. Greater than or equal to summation. K goes from 1 to infinity x minus x n e k. So I'm going to, instead of trying to make an identity, which I can't do very fruitfully, I want to write it in terms of this. This is true. And now for the e k, for k goes from 1 to k n, you can write it as uh, x e k minus alpha k super n. And then from k plus 1, kn plus 1 to infinity is just uh, 
there are no components of xn there, so then you just get x e k squared like that. Okay. So that's something small. So now I have this is something small. Okay. So now if you fix k, okay, so what, what happens? I know also that this is very small, this tail. Okay, now kn need not go to infinity, all right? So you have to work out, worry about the case where if kn goes to infinity or not. I think it was, um, so first I worry about whether, um, First, I'm going to worry about x itself, because you only have to represent x. So suppose that this x, this inner product x e k is equal to um, zero infinitely, excuse me, positive infinitely often. So if x e k is positive infinitely often, Then what's going to happen? Then um, then k n must be going to infinity, right? Uh, in order to uh, make this last sum go to zero, I need this sum to go to both. These are two positive terms. I need this to go to zero. Suppose it doesn't go to zero. Suppose k stays down here. K n stays below a finite number. Right, and ek x e k is positive infinitely often, and this is going to be uh, fixed from below this this infinite sum here. So k sub n has to go to infinity then to make the second sum go away. Okay. So this is case one. So then this will this will go away. That's good. Then what about this term? This first term. Well, now fix k, fix a k. Then all the then um, the inf as k n goes to infinity, this has to still be small. So that means if I fix a k, none of, as n goes to infinity, uh, this term must go to zero. Okay. Limit alpha k n as n goes to infinity is equal to x e k. All right, so then you get the, you get what you want, but you're still not done, okay, <laughs> unfortunately. So now you still have to arrange it. How am I going to actually get what I want? Now, and here's where I made the mistake, basically. And then if kn doesn't go to infinity, it's, it's, it's easier, okay. Um, So I'm only going to worry about this case one. Let's worry about this case one because I don't want to spend all day on this. So what do you do? Then you say, then xn is equal to the summation. I can always make this sum. Okay. Plus. Summation k goes from one to k sub n. Alpha k n minus x e k times e k minus the sum k n plus one to infinity x e k e k. Okay, this is an identity, I believe, um, because I've subtracted this whole thing off, right? I took this whole expression, which is what I want it to be in the end, and I subtracted it off here and here. Okay, all these sums make sense by Bessel's inequality. Okay, by Bessel's inequality in the theorem that as long as I have this, these coefficients square summable, I'm in an element in Hilbert space. Okay, so all these elements make sense. Now, um, Okay, now 
this one, well, and what about these last two terms? Actually, they're orthogonal, and actually this, this just shows it immediately. Um, actually, I don't even need any of this other jazz, it looks like, if I write it this way. Because this is shown to be small, right? And this is shown to be small. Because this square, the square norm of this one is just equal to this term, okay? Okay. So, <laughs> um, so is this showing that x n minus x? Okay. What do I want to show? I'm stuck again. I want to show this is. I want to show this is x. This is on the one hand the limit is x. On the other hand. Um, this xn, xn is going to x on the one hand, because that was the assumption, wasn't it? That was the assumption that I started with, x is the limit of xn. On the other hand, uh, this xn is, the only thing that's changing is these last two terms, and they're both going to zero in norm. Okay? So I guess that's it. You don't really have to do a whole lot. Um, so actually, if I write it this way, I don't even have to worry about cases looks like. It's just too easy, doesn't it? <laughs> so once you get it right, it, look, it looks kind of easy. Let's see, am I right? This goes to zero because this norm, this square norm is going to zero, right? This is going to zero because the square norm is going to zero. This goes to zero. This goes to zero. Okay. Because this square, well, because I said kn was going to infinity in this case. All right. If kn doesn't go to infinity, then I have to do something different. Okay, if k doesn't go to infinity, then I write a finite sum. And this term isn't here. Okay. And then it's trivial. Okay. So if kn is going to infinity, then this goes to zero because kn goes to infinity. Well, actually, that goes to zero. Actually, and that goes to zero automatically because of this Bessel's inequality here. So uh, it, you don't have to, in other words, once you... You think you have to use k and go to infinity, but you don't actually, because I've already assumed that this is going to zero. Therefore, this sum has to go to zero. This sum has to go to zero. So this goes to zero in norm. This is so the trick was this by star, okay? And this goes to zero in norm, both by star. Okay, so I think that's it. If you didn't know the trick, this is the trick, okay? Then, then you get stuck. Okay. All right. So you anyway. So this is QED. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So well, xn is some fixed vector plus two things that go to zero in norm. Therefore, this converges. Therefore, to summation k goes from one to infinity. X e k, e k, and since the limit is x on the one hand, and this is on the other hand. Then the limit is e then x is equal to this. Okay. Well, anyway. So I kind of flubbed it a little bit. You don't you you don't really have to take these cases. So that was a totality theory, in essence. All right, well, we're on beyond that now. I guess we're going on to Zorn's Lemma. Any comments about today's homework that was due today? No. We're done with Chapter 3, right? All the adjoint stuff? You didn't have any problems with it, huh? I don't know about that, but I didn't okay. ask either. Okay. Well, I'll ask about it on Thursday, then. Have a look at it and see if there's any more questions about it. Okay. Let's go on. I want to get Han Bonnick theorem, the first version of it, okay? And then we'll have the rest of the week to get the, the other two versions. These notes at least probably last this week. Okay, so last time we talked a little bit about Zorn's lemma, and we talked an application quickly at the end that every vector space has a Hamel basis. So we actually got through page three of these notes. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about a sublinear function in the Hanbonic, first version of the Hanbonic theorem. <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> so, what's a sublinear function? This is going to be, are you going to talk a little bit about, just give me some examples, but, or some consequences of the definition. It's going to be the following thing. It's going to be a function, so I have x is a vector space, and I have the function p from x, and in this case is to the um, real line, I believe, zero infinity. This satisfies one sublinearity, p of x plus y, thus equal to p of x plus p of y, and two positive. This is sublinearity. And the second condition is positive homogeneity. If I take p of alpha x, then that's going to be alpha p of x if alpha is non-negative. Okay? And so I actually I'm going to take a real vector space. Oh, it doesn't have to be real vector space, but I'm assuming this scalar alpha is a positive real number. So I guess the vector space itself does not have to be real. So that, that you are going to have a real vector space for the first version. He just says on a vector space, yeah. Okay. For the first version of the harmonic theorem, I am going to consider a real vector space. This is for alpha greater than zero, and it's called positive homogeneity because alpha is positive or non-negative. Okay, so what's an example of such a function? Take uh, any norm is such a such a sublinear function. Okay, if if x is a norm, if x is a normed vector space, then the norm p of x equals the norm of x satisfies. One and two. Okay, that's pretty easy by the triangle inequality. Okay, so any norm, but also a semi-norm would satisfy. What's a semi-norm? A semi-norm. Uh, a semi-norm would satisfy this condition. Also. Um, for example, uh, let's take x equals c zero one, <laughs> my favorite space. X equals c zero one, and let's take uh, p of x equals to um, absolute value of x at one half. So this is just for x, and let x be in capital X, so X equals X of T, 0 less equal to T less equal to, a, to 1 is a sum continuous function, right? But P of X equals the absolute value of X of 1 half. And that's not a norm because certainly the function can be non-zero, but P can be 0, right? So all I have to do is make a function that's 0 at X equals, at T equals a half, and then P is 0. So clearly P can be, so it, in other words, it, it sends many non-zero functions to zero, okay? But on the other hand, it's clear that it satisfies the sublinearity of a positive homogeneity, okay? So this is a semi-norm, and that it satisfies P, it satisfies one and two, it satisfies uh, one, and also, uh, something more, two, uh, well, also uh, three, I'll call it three, p of alpha x equals the absolute value of alpha p of x. Okay? So that's stronger for any, for all alpha. And these could be in complex numbers. Okay? 
even. Okay? If I took complex value continuous functions, it doesn't matter if I consider this a real vector space or a complex vector space or complex valued functions. Okay? All right. Is a seminar is it is a semi norm because it satisfies one and also three. So two is not strong enough to be as uh, so any semi norm in particular is sublinear, okay? Because it's actually stronger than this, but we're only assuming the positive homogeneity, okay? So sublinear is a little bit weaker condition. Okay. All right. So you can look up the semi norm, semi norm defined in uh, 2.3 point 12, I think it is, page 71, is where they talk about semi norms. Anyway, there's all these little different things. Yeah. Okay, so let's, that's what a sublinear function is. Um, it has to be, let's see, p of 0 has to be equal to 0, right? If I take alpha equal to 0, then I get 0 here. So p of 0 is equal to 0. And all of these, uh, whenever you have this homogeneity condition, you're going to see that p of 0 has got to be 0. Okay. And also... And actually, the non-negativity also follows from here, because I put x. No, that doesn't follow. Uh, it doesn't follow in this case. So you really do need to assume that it's non-negative here. OK? Um, a semi-norm would automatically be non-negative. Why is that? A semi-norm is automatically non-negative Because you have uh, 0 equals p of 0, the 0 vector, equals p of x plus minus x, which is less than or equal to p of x plus p of minus x. But p of minus x is, is minus 1 times p of x in the semi-norm case, if 3 holds, equals p of x plus negative 1 times p of x by 3. Okay, and so that's equal to 2p of x, so the p of x is non negative. So you don't have to say it's a non negative function if you look on page 71. So, all these little variations, little tricks you would have from these definitions. Just how we go through the definitions once, because you're going to have a bunch of definitions in, uh, well, these, uh, you're going to have the sublinear function, and then you're also going to have the equivalent definition of a semi-norm in the next harmonic theorem. Okay. Okay. So what is a harmonic? Okay. So assume you have the sublinear function. <laughs> okay. Um, I better leave that definition out, okay, because that's what we're going to work with now. I think I didn't leave some of these things in the notes, so this is, you know, my comments about semi-norms and so on are just on the board here. Not too hard to figure out, but, okay, so what's the han bonnach theorem? So this is a sublinear function. Definition here. So Han Bonnach theorem one. Version one, four point two dash one, I guess what it's the title of it in the book. Let X be a real vector space. We're only going to work with a vector space right now. Let X so you're just going to get the vector space version of it. Let x be a real vector space. 
No norms. And let Z be a subspace. Let capital Z be a subspace of X. Okay. And suppose F is a linear functional on Z. So there's no bounded linear functional here either because we're just working with a vector space. There's no norm, okay? So this is going to be algebraic completely. If, okay, and let, um, and let uh, P be a sublinear function. Let P be a sublinear function on all of X. So we have something maybe like a semi-norm or what have you, okay, running around. But a sublinear function anyway, okay. On all of X, and suppose f of z is less than or equal to p of z for all z in the subspace. Okay, so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that I can extend f to a linear functional on the whole space. <coughs> conclusion? There exists a linear functional f tilde on all of x that extends my original functional. That means that f tilde of z is equal to f of z on, on z. So it takes the same values as the original linear functional on the original subspace so that also um, f tilde is bounded by this semi, excuse me, by this sublinear function on all of x. It wouldn't be difficult to linearly extend f, but then you've got to extend it so that it's still continues to satisfy this inequality, f tilde of x less than p of x for all x belonging to the whole space. Okay. How do you do that? Let's see if we can give the, give the sketch. The end proof is a little bit long-winded. The beginning is very simple. How do you actually get the existence by Zorn's lemma? What's the setup? Okay. Here's the setup. Um, uh, to prove proof application of Zorn's lemma. So what did Zorn's lemma say? Zorn's lemma says, give me a partially ordered non-empty set. So, okay, and the assumption is that every chain, every chain, which is a totally ordered subset, should have an, uh, an upper bound, all right? And then you'll have a maximal element, okay? We want to set that up. And then we want to prove the maximal element is the thing. So we want to establish f tilde as the maximal element. So therefore, what I'm going to need is uh, I'm going to consider the set of all linear functionals uh, on subspaces. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is if uh, if g is a linear functional. Uh, that extends 
So I'm going to only consider ones that extend f. Um, so the domain of G is going to tend to contain Z. You'll see how we're going, to, we're going to construct these in just a little bit. We're going to be able to construct these. So the domain of G contains Z. And such that G of X is less than or equal to P of X on the domain of G. So I'm going to say, well, let's go, let's see if I can go a little bit. Let's go, let's go to a subspace that's a little bit bigger than Z and get a function G that extends F. Anyway, so it's equal to F on Z, but it's a linear functional and has some more values than, or some more domain than, than F had. And suppose it also satisfies the uh, inequality that G of X is also equal to a sublinear function on the domain of G. So for X in the domain of G. So it's, it's doing sort of what F tilde would do, only maybe at, a, at the, uh, only at the level of the domain of G. Okay. Suppose I have that situation. Okay. That's going to be my element in my set. That's so I have a non-empty set because f is one such function itself. Domain of g equal to z. So I have one element in this set of linear functionals. Starting point. Okay. All right. But presumably there are more than just that one. In fact, how would you how would you imagine that you could construct another linear functional? That would extend. How could I, if I was going to try to construct this, not using Zorn's lemma, but let's say, just just construct such a G, what would I do? I could take an element that's not in Z, assuming that Z is not the full space itself already. Because they actually have a proper subspace, otherwise I'm already done, right? So take something that's in Z to construct such a D. Z that extends RG that extends F, we will let um, I think Y1 be something in X minus Z, okay? Something in an element that's not in Z but is in X, okay? And define G of of um, Z plus uh, alpha Y1 is equal to F of Z plus alpha C, or some C, some uh, real C, a real C and a real alpha. Here we're working in the real case anyway, all right? So everything, okay, so then I'm going to take uh, domain of G equal to um, the span of Z and this Y1. So I'm just going to get one more basis. I'm going to get one more element. Okay, and I'm going to take the span of those two. That's going to be a vector space. And I'm going to take G, any, anything in this vector space, the span of Z and one more vector that's not in Z, can be written as Z plus alpha Y1 for some unique alpha, all right, and some z in, in, in z, all right? Does it, you know how you do that? You just take, so you know, I'm taking as all possible values z plus alpha y1, okay? So that, that's going to be my vector space, all right? z and z and alpha in the reals, okay? So that's going to be my domain of g. And then I'll just define uh, this, make this definition, G of Z like that. All right? And then if alpha is zero, which corresponds to my having an element that started with Z only, then I certainly have F of Z. All right? But clearly, if I take, uh, clearly this is going to be a linear thing then. So you have to just think about it a little bit. Play with your linear algebra just a little bit. That's going to be a linear functional. Now, does it satisfy g of x less than or equal to p of x? Only for certain values of c, and we're going to see that in the end part of the proof, how you do that. Okay. 
uh, will satisfy g of x less or equal to p of x for such an x if c is chosen appropriately. So it's not just for any c, but only for certain c's, but there do exist values of c for which it is a linear functional and will continue to satisfy that inequality. And that's the guts of the proof, that you can go one next level, okay? You can go one next level, and therefore you could continue to keep going, presumably forever, until you reach the whole of the space. So let's apply. So let's, I'm going to skip this, the guts of the proof here that you can find such a C, which is at the end, and, let's, and finish the general, the general nonsense part of the proof, which is the Zorn's Lemma part. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's a general nonsense, and then there's a, <laughs> a computation. All right? Do you understand what I mean? I, I'm sorry, I haven't used that term general nonsense very often. In fact, never in this class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to use Yeah, because you have to use Zorn's lemma. Okay. So, so what's the, how do you, so, 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 so I have M my equals the set of all linear extensions G of F as above, so M is not empty because it contains the singleton F itself, which maps Z to the reals. Okay, <clears throat> all right? It contains that linear functional. All right, and say G uh, is less than or equal to something else. G is less than or equal to H. If the domain of G is contained in the domain of H, okay, in this in this thing, so linear, so you're going to include besides the the function, you're going to have the domain as well. So it's going to be a, a pair or just this this kind of setup. You've got the functional and its domain, okay. G is also from H if and. Uh, for G and H in, in this thing. So they all have this property that they're bounded by the sublinear functional on their sublinear function on their domain. Okay? So it has this property. Each of these elements has this property. Okay? So that's the less than or equal to. And if C is a chain, now I want to establish the hypothesis of Zorn's lemma. I need to take a chain. If C now is a chain in um, this M, okay, so it consists of one or more linear functionals having these properties, okay? So it's totally ordered in the sense that every function is less than or equal to another one in this chain, okay? Then what can I do? Then for any uh, G1 and G2, okay, in C, we have that um, G1 and G2 agree on the smaller of the two domains. G, DG1 intersect DG2. One of the domains is smaller than the other. Okay? So actually this intersection is just trivial. It's just the smaller one. Okay? It's not actually, you know, it's not. You've got this kind of a thing. Okay, here's DG1. Here's DG2. It's this kind of a situation where it's a subset of vector spaces. A line inside of a plane. Okay. <laughs> now, 
Uh, so what, how could I actually define so the claim is this I need to find a maximal element a maximal element exists a maximal element of C exists as follows so in other words there's a last element so to speak in C um, to me uh, least upper bound uh, is a least upper bound no I'm sorry an upper bound an upper bound, that's what I need. Uh, G hat of X equal to. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a union of all the domains. It's equal to G of X. Okay when x is in the domain of g okay all right and that's uh, the domain of g hat um, and this is for g in belonging to the chain so the domain of g hat is going to be the union of all the domains of g for g belonging to this change. In other words, you have a consistent definition of a linear functional where you can take the union of all the domains so you, you're basically defining this, this linear functional piecewise right? this is a piecewise definition, I just couldn't list all of the infinitely many functions that it could equal okay, it's a piecewise definition And so then you just have, the, this is the abstract nonsense, you're just saying, okay, <laughs> I'll just take the domain to be the union of all of them. That's again a vector space, okay? G of X is less than the P of X, no matter how, where I've defined it, okay? Therefore, G hat of X is less than the P of X on this whole domain, okay? Okay, so then I have G hat of X, less than the P of X, for all x in this domain of g hat. Okay, so that's a an upper bound. Is an upper bound because every other function is less than or equal to it. Okay, that's in this chain. <laughs> it's too easy. Anyway, so there's an upper bound. Therefore, by Zorn's lemma, there's a maximal element. Okay, it still leaves the hard work though. Is the maximal element going to be a linear functional on all of X or not. So you can see where the, this is going. Okay, so therefore, by Zorn's lemma, there exists a maximal element, F tilde in M. Okay, so the question is, is whether f tilde of x is less, f tilde is going to be linear all right, it's going to be a linear extension of f by definition of being in this set m, okay, but the question is, is it less than or equal to p of x for all x in capital X, all right, and so, so there's, an there's the application done, now I have to do the hard work to show yes, that it really is. Okay, suppose um, the domain of F tilde, suppose that F tilde um, is less or equal to P of X, it will be less or equal to P of X on some subspace, on a subspace, I think, what are we going to call it now? On a subspace Y. Well, I'll call it on df tilde, which is a strict subset of x. Okay, so in subspace. That is a strict subspace. So it is true. So I've got some domain, but suppose it's not the whole space x. Okay, obtain a contradiction. Uh, 
by showing that we can extend it. So find this C down below. Okay? Obtain a contradiction by showing we can find a real C so that the definition, I'll see now, I'm going to call it a different name now. I'll call it G1. G1 I'm going to use exactly this definition I have below, okay, that I put in parentheses. But I'll, let's see, I'm going to call it a different name. The definition, um, so the, the definition G1 of, I call it different letters too, of, of uh, what's this? So that, so that uh, yeah, we'll see, so that, uh, we can extend f tilde to a function g1 as indicated before. Above. Okay, let's do this. So let's work, let's work the recipe now. So define Um, y1 equals the span of the domain of f tilde and this single and some element y1 where y1 is in x minus the domain of f tilde. So go ahead and construct this bigger vector space. This between the domain of f tilde and x and maybe equal to x somehow. Okay. So now let x be in, I'm going to put it x be in y. Let x be in y1, then x can be rewritten as y plus alpha y1 for uh, y in the domain of f tilde. This is uniquely written this way. and uh, alpha some real number. I'm only taking the real span. The real span. Because I'm only working in the real context. Okay? And this is a unique representation. Okay. Now then you find G sub 1 of x to be equal to f tilde of x plus alpha c. As I had indicated, I'm sorry, f tilde of y. I used different notation before. I used z because <laughs> it was appropriate then. Okay? And now I've gone up to y because I've gotten up. Uh, presumably I've gotten somewhere with this uh, maximal stuff, but you can see uh, it's the same proof. Is this if I had started from zilch? Okay. If I started from zilch, but for free, then I get to the maximum point. Okay. And then I can use this argument of extending to get a contradiction. Okay. So <laughs> it's as though I was just going to construct it from scratch that I can show from one level to the next level. I can always find such a C. Okay. So the whole point is to be able to find such a C. That's the whole test of the proof. You see what I'm saying? So general nonsense plus being able to find the C. Okay. <laughs> so can I go to one level? Okay. So this, how do you how do you do it? And I don't think I'm going to have enough time here to finish the whole job. But. Um, So what do I need? I need g1 of x less or equal to p of x for all x and y1. Here's what I need. I need what I call double star in these notes. I'm going to have to finish it next time, it looks like. And you can read it up in the book or in the notes. It's the same, pretty much. I need double star 
that g1 of x is less or equal to p of x for all x belonging to this y1. Okay? And know if I can do this, then I will have found uh, an element that's bigger than f tilde. G1 would then be bigger than F tilde, strictly bigger, and therefore I'd have a contradiction because F tilde was supposedly a maximal element and there are no elements bigger than F tilde in this partially ordered set. Okay? Okay. If this, is, if this could be done, then F tilde is strictly less than G1, a contradiction. To the maximality. Of F tilde. So strictly less means less than or equal to but not equal. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so how do I do that? Okay, let's see if I could sort of guess the conditions I'm going to need to do that. What am I going to need? And I'm going to, let's look at this condition. G1 of x less than or equal to P of x. Okay, so that means that I need, so double star is rewritten as F tilde of Y plus alpha C less than or equal to P of y plus alpha c, okay? For all alpha and some c, for all alpha and r and some c to be chosen, okay? If it's going to work. That's what I need. I already know that f tilde of y less than equal to p of y, okay? So, so what do I get? Uh, let's take um, alpha equal to 1. Implies that I need, um, let's see, c less than or equal to p of y plus y1. I'm sorry, this should have been alpha y1, not alpha c, okay? and minus F tilde of Y, okay, for all Y in the domain of F tilde. Okay, and what else can I do? Also, we're taking alpha equal minus 1, and x equals minus z minus y1 for some z in the domain of f tilde. Then this gives that I need, plus I need. Um, F tilde of minus z minus c because alpha is minus one. Okay, less than or equal to p. The the y is the minus z and the alpha is minus one minus z minus y one. Okay, so if I rearrange that, then it tells me that I need that, um, so I'm just trying to see what, what I would actually need by putting, by playing around a little bit. This will tell me that I need, um, I'm going to call this 2. I need this 2. I don't know where, where 1 went. I think 1 was um, this. Uh, this was 1. Okay. This is 2. I'm going to need this and I need, which is 3 which is um, 
if I rewrite this, I need minus p of minus z minus y1 minus f tilde of z less than or equal to c for all z in df tilde. So notice what I've got here in these boxes 2 and 3. In these boxes 2 and 3, I've got um, an expression depends on, on y, and there's a fixed constant y1, there's a fixed vector y1 here, but other than this, this is, just, this is uh, depending on y alone, and this expression depends on z alone. Okay, so what I have to basically do is I have to see if, if, um, if everything on the left side of this 3 is less than everything on the right side of, of 2. If, if for every z and for every y, this is less equal to this, then there is such a c. Okay. So it turns out that uh, I just need to show that there's a gap between these two sides. All right. And then it turns out that that is enough by the uh, sublinearity of p and the linearity of f. In other words, taking these special cases, it'll fall out as long as I can show there's a gap here. I need to show... Um, minus p of minus z minus y1 minus f tilde of z less than or equal to p of y plus y1 minus f tilde of y for all z and y in the domain of f tilde. Okay? Okay, and if I can do that, Then I'll be I'll be good. Okay, so let's check this out, um, and then you get it. You actually show that this this is what I call four. Okay, so in, fee, in fact four does hold. Okay, four does hold, and I just ran out of time to do it. Okay, but that's on the top of page six of these notes. Okay, so it's kind of strange. <laughs> Kind of strange. A lot of stuff to keep track of. I know, I know. But this, the basic idea is general nonsense plus. Okay, I'm going to extend like this. Obviously, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I? Can I do something like that? So I, I need to check. And so then it looks. It's just a lot of writing down of junk. And then I have to get the basic uh, semi-norm inequality to fall in place, and it will work. So then you just check. You have just the bare minimum number of assumptions on p to make it work. Be a good in class test problem. Just it that, would? Well, just that one. This is what you do. <laughs> It'd probably take you the whole class to. Okay, I'll remember that. Final exam. Proves, <laughs> prove on Bonnock theorem. You gonna get it? It is not a bad idea. You know, I mean, if that was the only thing you had to do, then yeah. it would be. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, it was like that. I had a complex of variable yeah. scores like that. Okay, you want to you want to change your grade from B plus to A minus. Come and take the final exam, and the final exam was prove the Riemann mapping theorem. <laughs> just sit down and do it yeah. for two and a half hours. Yeah, <laughs> you just have to really understand it. That section, right? <laughs> I did. That's what I studied, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay.